The historian Peter Frankopan is no stranger to paradigm shifts in thinking. His epic history, The Silk Roads, moved away from a Eurocentric vision of the past to one which saw the important links between the East and West and became a huge bestseller as a result. A new book from him is always going to be an event, and The Earth Transformed is even more ambitious in its scope. In attempting to show how climate itself has shaped nations, notions, and every moment of our existence on this planet, he begins four and a half billion years ago and brings us right up to the present day. We sat down to talk about the ways in which climate has shaped us and the very tragic consequences of our shaping of it. Peter, The, the Earth Transformed is what I refer to as a, it's a chunky book. There's lots of stuff in here. Um, and you take on the task of telling an, uh, a history which goes right from the very dawn of time right up to the present day, which, of course, is about as wide a span of history as you could possibly take on. Um, and we will get to some of the details in the book, but I suppose what I wanted to ask first was about some of the science that has allowed a book like this to actually be written. Because, of course, with a lot of the things in the book, as I was reading, I was like, How? How do you, how do we know this? How 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 can you find out these things? Because it's not just a question of what people would usually think of it, the historical record, whether that's sort of written records or archaeology. It's going way beyond that. Would you mind telling us a little bit about some of the science that's made this book possible? Sure. Well, look, thank you. Well, f- first of all, let me say thank you to Waterstones and your lovely uh, book selling colleagues and your customers, uh, without whom I wouldn't be sitting here today. You know, I was extremely lucky and grateful that a book that I wrote that came out eight years ago called Silk Roads was so visible and so prominently displayed in your shops. And, and I've spoken to so many of your booksellers in different stores when I pop in and, and offer to sign copies, uh, that that not only gave me a lot of confidence that, you know, there is a, that there are people who are interested in places like Central Asia, but also that, um, you know, that you can write books about things that people don't think they want to know about, which was, I spent most of my career doing that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful and thank you for giving me the time today to talk about it. It's, I mean, I'm slightly defensive. It's not that long. I mean, it's 650 pages, which is quite chunky, um, but it's perfect for beach time reading. And mm-hmm. if you think about it on a kind of per, I mean, with Silk Roads, it was that covered about 4,000 years. This one, as you say, goes back to the dawn of time. So 650 pages to go from sort of 5 billion years ago to today, <laughs> you know, on a kind of per, per sort of 100 million years basis, you know, it's not that bad. And it teach, it teach everything you want to know. Uh, but it's a great question about the sciences. Okay, well, so as a kind of historian, when I was young and learning how to be a historian or being taught how to be a historian, uh, I was taught how to read texts. You know, that was the key thing that you were taught how to try to do to understand audience and reception, the manuscript tradition. Um, you know, what are people writing for? How do, what are their cultural influences? What are they saying? And uh, as I was going through into sort of my PhD you, know, you had to learn that material culture, things like coins, the archaeology were also important as well. And that was a kind of first introduction to kind of empirical studies around mm-hmm. how you be a historian. The thing that is moving by far the fastest in my field is you know, every now and again, you get an Indiana Jones moment where someone finds a manuscript in a cave that they didn't know about, or mm-hmm. they'd go for a dig and instead of finding you know, a pot in a pan, they find an entire city that no one knew existed. That does happen quite often. I mean, some colleagues of mine digging in Karakoram in uh, Mongolia uh, have found essentially the great palace of the great Khan, you know, recently. So these things, they do happen and they happen quite often. But the applied and physical and natural sciences are producing material on a kind of exponential, impossible to keep up kind of scale. And those are things like measuring bubbles in ice cores. You drill down deep into a glacier or into an ice core in the Antarctic or um, in Greenland, for example. And that will show you levels of contamination, for example, of lead. That will show you levels of carbon dioxide. And because it's measurable, you can see that there are things that are changing. It's the same with things like tree ring data, where the the, the, the ways in which trees grow are not necessarily predictable, but if you have lots of trees and they're, you can measure how often they're, they're, they're growing, how quickly they're growing, you can see that there are patterns where there's acceleration sometimes and sometimes very rapid deceleration. Then you find things like um, calcium carbonate deposits in caves, stalagmites, for example, builds up typically of water that's dripped through the cave roof. And again, you get sequences that you can measure multi-decadal, multi-century sequences. 
what the difficulty about all of that, like any mathematician will remember, or any of you who um, remember your sciences from school, or maybe 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 Regis Professor of Physics is listening on the podcast too, uh, <laughs> is that the, the challenge is how do you interpret that data, right? But you have huge archives of material that are telling you something. And the question then is to work out, I guess, three things. One, what are they telling you? You know, how do you measure it? Is it robust data? Is it an anomaly that you know can't, doesn't reflect anywhere else? How do you put it in context? Second, uh, how do you date it? And then third, how do you use that material? For example, if you find that there's a period of drought that lasts for decades or longer, or very significant climatic change, let's say from volcanic eruptions that leave um, deposits in ice cores, for example, what, how do you then interpret that when you, when you can find that there are things that happen in the historical record, like uh, falls of rulers or food shortages or price spikes in the, in the cost of wheat, which would typically be the result of the fact that there's less of it to go around? And can you dovetail the sequence of um, changes of particularly climate, but around the natural world into our kind of human history? And also the history of, of animals. You know, we're not alone on this planet. Plants no. and animals reacting all the time. So the, the challenge, I think, is first to absorb all of the scientific materials. And although lots of it is to do with climate, in fact, in my book, I also do lots around genetic materials, haplotypes, uh, teeth enamel, being able to see what people are eating, how far they're traveling, to see how it is that our species in particular has kind of interacted with the natural world and modified it and changed it. You know, how we've moved plants and animals around the world uh you know rubber which is from south america is now you know massive um in southeast asia or uh, things like pineapples and chilies and cocoa also from south america or potatoes for your sunday lunch um you know are now staple diets that we think the potato is a quintessentially english crop or chilies are must be must be indian because of the spicy spiciness so how that way in which we've, we've remodeled and to do that in a way that's empirical and data-led and led by the sciences. And these materials are extremely abundant and um, you know, offer not just a ray of light onto how we think about the past, but a kind of full kaleidoscope. And mm. um, it's great to be introducing some of that beyond the kind of scholarship. You know, there are a lot of environmental historians who work on some of these things, mm. but uh, bring it up perhaps to a, to a wider group of, of readers. I can only imagine the huge task you've been through over the last few years trying to wrangle all of this material into a sort of a coherent narrative I suppose but also a coherent thesis about you know what what we mean when we talk about climatic change uh, on the planet obviously in the modern day we we have the, the climate crisis that people are talking about and whilst that isn't separate from what you're talking about in the book it is slightly different and we'll come to that a bit later but what I thought was really interesting was that obviously this discussion about how changes in climate have had huge impacts on the history that we know and understand and I'll pick out a few moments which I thought were really striking to me one was to do with of course how benign climate periods in history obviously help empires to grow or for for people to have stable uh history to live through and obviously the opposite um when it's uh, not stable but this the curse of akkad i'm going to raise which is this idea that in the formation of religion or religious ideas um when you have these sort of benevolent or predictable environmental conditions religious systems arise where there isn't a sort of moralizing deity who punishes people Tell me a little bit more about that, because I just think it's one of those sort of mind blowing things we think about religions as being, you know, that they must come from something. The idea that they may have been influenced by climate itself is fascinating to me. So tell me a bit more about the curse of Akkad. Yeah, OK, well, I mean, it's it's it, I, I love what I do. So it has been, and, you know, writing any book is a nightmare, whether it's a 50 page, <laughs> uh, you know, novel or poem. You know, it's 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 tricky. But on the other hand, you know, it's not splitting the atom. But I mean, I love what I do. So it's a, it's a joy. I mean, it's terrifying writing a book and knowing that any reader can put a one star review on Amazon because the, the packaging wasn't good enough on the like cover. <laughs> and, you know, you have to live with that. But, you know, o over the long term, it will come out. But I think that thinking about big questions around why, uh, uh, why do I, for example, around religions, you know, why is it that religions have evolved in very similar ways in 
disconnected different parts of the world but in some cases they are there are very striking um, similarities but also differences so for example in the kind of Mediterranean world and in Mesopotamia that you're talking about the Akkadian Empire uh, we have what are called what, what anthropologists call moralizing gods which is you know if uh, you suffer from drought or there's too much rain or your crops fail you're clearly being punished by supernatural forces and I guess there are cynical ways to understand that one is if you're the leader or you're part of a hierarchy of clerics and elites and whatever you need to explain and blame someone else so clearly the reason you've been punished and everyone is dying of hunger and can't eat is not your fault it's because of the gods although quite quickly that gets then stapled into quite a useful subversive tool which is clearly if we're being punished it's because the leader himself usually himself is mm. the one who's let us all down so this idea of punishment and reward is something that is very uh, familiar to us i guess in the way we think about religions you know dovetailed into things like the Old Testament, into mm. the Quran, into the Bible, into ancient Greek deities, Mesopotamia, etc. Uh, those moralizing gods don't exist in the Chinese tradition, uh, or they're very different kind of character where uh, things are much more about peace and order. There isn't the tradition of punishment from on high, although it's absolutely fundamental that the ruler has what's called in many of the Chin Chinese cultures, a mandate from heaven. Hmm. And one reason for that is that it seems to be that climatic, climatic conditions in most parts of the old Chinese kingdoms, which is not exactly the same territories as are occupied by the People's Republic of China today, uh, are more stable. And so the engagement with the kinds of problems you have tends to be man-made rather than you know, celestial, supernatural and climatological. Uh, things like, therefore, one thinks through around things like how does the body decay after it, after you die? And in humid conditions, decomposition happens much more quickly than, for example, in northern China, much colder, much cooler, where bodies can lie in state for longer. And so your engagement with a dead body is different, even burying it in the ground is slightly different if it's icy and you can't dig through the, through the terrain. So I think that the, the good history asks interesting questions. And, you know, luckily, no historian, no historian exists in a bubble. So you, you draw on fantastic research done by colleagues, peers, and so on, to try to explain that these are what the differences look like, and here are some potential solutions. And, you know, with things like religion, I guess one of the questions is, uh, I, I've always thought about, not just with climate, is how do we understand our place in the world? You know, mm. why should we be kind to each other? Why do bad things happen to good people? And uh, why do good things happen to bad people? And our sort of common ancestors going back millennia have struggled with those same questions and trying to find cosmological explanations for how and why haven't just been through blind faith, you know, engagement with sciences, attempts to try to understand, to predict, uh, to influence, go back millennia. In fact, they go back beyond the written records that start about, I don't know, 5,000 years ago or so. And so I think thinking through things like religion, it's sort of what is the what is the ecological hand of cards that you've been dealt and how does that differ and mm. scrolling through into the book it's things like you know working out why is it that political institutions for example are more robust and more embedded constitutionally in regions that are further away from the tropics why is it that we find things like equalities easier and it's not because we are more enlightened or cleverer it's partly to do with wealth partly to do with the abilities of mercantile capital merchants to protect their positions but it's also to do with health environments and disease environments and life expectancies and the ways in which you have to work out how family units function so some of it is about trying to pull together into a kind of holistic view of you know why what is this home that we all this planet we call as home how, how has it shaped these big deep trends and try not to be too sort of dogmatic but to try to explain that there are striking differences the one degree that you get further away from the tropics there, there start to be significant changes in political representation gdp production resource allocation etc so political participation and pointing that out and trying to then think why that might be i think is really interesting it, it is completely fascinating um i'm going to sort of ping you around in history a bit slightly now we're going to rock it forwards to, to another time period which I found fascinating which was the chapter in which you're talking about I suppose the the development of um, 
what what would become modern slavery uh well sorry not modern slavery but you know the sort of the slavery that we would probably remember from from school um and how obviously that was driven by the economics of a developing world and the uh crops that were being grown in different parts of the world and needed to be traded but what i was amazed by was that how this was tied with climate and disease and the disease resistance of um the people who were being stolen from Africa to to work in other parts of the world. And in fact, it was their strength and their ability to resist those diseases that meant that they were exploited to allow that continued growth. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how climate has something to do with slavery? Sure. I guess, I guess thinking about the transatlantic slave trade, and as you say, you know, that's something which I never heard about at school. You know, we weren't taught about it. So, you know, thank God that is now part of the kind of mainstream of what we learn about structural racism, where it came from, what the prices are to pay. But, you know, one of the questions that I always was slightly, I wouldn't say troubled about, but always sort of never quite understood was why is it that if Europeans were able and had money to buy other people's lives and had military technologies and big ships, why didn't they just create plantations to grow sugar and cotton and tobacco and things like that in, in West Africa? You know, why cross the Atlantic to go and do that? It's much further away. It's much more expensive to ship. Uh, you've got to involve shipping people across the ocean as well as your goods on the way back. Why not just create uh, what you need quite locally? You know, West Africa is really not that far or difficult to reach. And I, I guess the first answer to that is that the robustness of political systems in West Africa was such that Europeans, in the words of a, of a very famous historian, uh, couldn't get within a can- couldn't get beyond a cannon shot from the coast, you know, so Europeans couldn't get themselves there. So looking for areas to um, create the cash crops that, that were of interest and produced great profits, of course, wanted you know, mercantile capital and, and, and investors want the costs to be absolutely rock bottom as low as possible. And the cheapest way to do that in any political system, in any era, in any geography, is slave labour. Often through prisoners of war, people you beat and so on and capture, it's the labour force matters. The structure of how it worked in the Caribbean and in the southern part of America, where the, the, mo- the main sort of areas of focus were cash crops, which are very labour intensive, uh, sugar, cotton, tobacco in particular, um, was not only to find a way of getting people over there to start with it's indentured servants from all over Europe particularly Ireland but but then quite quickly develops towards this massive transatlantic um, slave system it is that there's a predisposition in the tropics towards genetic in, in West Africa towards a mutation that protects against malaria mm-hmm. because malaria has been endemic for thousands of years and in fact there are other autoimmune resistances in many populations in across different parts of West Africa. But there's a quite a strong and striking correlation between uh, slaves who are bought in parts of West Africa where the genetic mutation that that protects against malaria is highest. And in to put some context into that, the average life expectancy, most of most, almost half of people didn't get past the age of 18 who are European, um, and 20% didn't make it past the age of five. So Finding populations who are not able, not just able to force to work for you. And, you know, the way that slavery worked was to not just sell the lives and ship in grotesque conditions, but to to ensure that even the descendants of slaves were trapped in that system. Mm. was Not just because uh, labor is free, but also the resistance and physical superiority of those populations to survive and work in conditions where malaria really kicks off in the 1670s and 1680s probably closely related to shifts in El Nino patterns that make virulence spread very, very quickly. And not just malaria, also yellow fever and others. Mm. So um, that I think that was quite an interesting point of trying to think through what is it that slave labour does or coerced labour does beyond just the inhumane and racism, uh, the inhumanity and the racism. It's are there reasons why we have why Europeans subverted this world where we created the world where the where white Europeans looked superior, whereas in fact we were p- very poorly equipped genetically to cope with parts of the world uh, because of disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think that's a kind of quite an interesting part of of the book of of working through how did um, markets work, what price differentials were there, 
what levels of genetic mutations can one detect and how do those emerge? And of course, the irony of that is that the protection was the undoing of so many millions of lives because had resistance been non-existent as it was for Europeans, then, mm. then perhaps different populations would have been coerced rather than from West Africa. As you say, yeah, it, it, there is a grim irony to that whole uh, period and, and, and sort of the conclusions you've drawn from from the new science as well. And there's there are lots of ironies through the book. One period that struck me was this the period of nuclear testing. Um, so this is fast forwarding right now to the sort of the 1950s and 60s. And obviously, we're aware of the environmental impact of really big things. So it, after reading this book, I've never been more terrified of volcanoes because it appears that if you want something to really affect the climate on the planet Earth, it's definitely volcanoes that do ter- terrible amounts of damage. But yeah, we're, over, we're overdue a big one as well. We're really overdue well, one. So, yeah. That's why I'm terrified, because you've made it very clear that we're, <laughs> we're waiting for the next huge explosion, the, the like of which we ha- we haven't lived through. So we, we can't really imagine what the difference would be. But um, yeah, sorry, the nuclear testing in the 50s and 60s has has a sort of dual effect, as you explain in the book. One is that it actually has this effect of suppression of the climatic change. So the sort of gradual warming um, in the 20th century is slightly slowed by the effects of nuclear testing. So the sort of particulate matter that ended up in the atmosphere, um, which is a bizarre, if you would like to call it, benefit um, of nuclear testing. But also the concerns about monitoring that actually led to the development of technologies which are what we now use to monitor climatic change is that right tell us a little bit more about why that sort of that period is is quite important for the climate well so we start to see um changes to uh air temperatures and sea surface temperatures uh not surprisingly in the second half of the 19th century because the industrial revolution suddenly starts to eject large amounts of carbon dioxide into the air although the massive acceleration has been um, since the 1990s. So in fact, David Wallace Wells in his book uh, in, in Hospitable Earth uh, reminds that something like 75% of all carbon burnt by humans has been since the first episode of Seinfeld was released. <laughs> so, you know, which is terrifying. That, that, that kickoff of the last 30 years has been particularly bad. But sea levels started to rise very slowly from about 1863. And the world was clearly warming at the in the sort of early 20th century. Mm. And that comes to a stop around about the end of the Second World War. And there are lots of different potential explanations of the behavior of the sun, the, ex- the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. We've got lots of uh, global climate systems that interlock that, you know, I write about a lot in the book. But clearly the um, detonation of about 400 plus uh, nuclear bombs atmospheric with atmospheric consequences eject large amounts of fine materials into the atmosphere that looks like it shields the earth from um, from uh, sun's rays and produces a spell of cooling in the first instance. And I think that that is a kind of unforeseen consequence. I mean, it was that turned out better than some of those who worked on the early nuclear programs were worried about. They were worried that uh, a nuclear detonation would ignite the atmosphere and burn us all to a crisp. Mm. Um, so in fact, you could argue that, that it turned out OK in the end. But the worries around the fears of of, uh, nuclear disaster and of uh, nuclear war, which was very much the world that I grew up in. I was was born in the early 1970s and through the 70s and 80s, you know, the assumption was for my generation and above and a little bit below uh, was that the world would at some point through miscalculation or through through confrontation. And we'd seen it with the Cuba crisis. We'd seen it with kind of false alerts. Um, in 1983, for example, we now know there was it was quite close to uh, mis- misunderstandings on both sides that there would be a nuclear uh, confrontation which would just keep on escalating mm-hmm. uh, to the point that the the, sort of the doctrines in the 1970 were called mutually assured destruction. The reason why people didn't fire missiles, one missile, was that they'd get hundreds back at them and then thousands back and then we'd all be dead. So the the worries around what nuclear war would do to our atmosphere were were very, very real and produced a lot of of, um, research into what exactly would happen to global temperatures, what would happen to ecosystems, what would happen to plant and animal life, how would one survive if you weren't caught up in the destructive detonations as as devices blew up in one city after the next. And I think that one of the consequences of that was that 
a real breakthrough in the relations between uh, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s was around trying to take some of that off the table that was quite closely linked to the discovery of a big hole in the ozone layer and environmental concerns that was quite closely connected with things like the campaign for nuclear disarmament at CND and the rise of the eco- ecological movements of a real sensitivity that this is we've only got one shot mm. and arming our militaries and putting the kind of destructive power in the hands of, well, actually not very many people, uh, well, not very many men, I should say, um, was, was something that we would all pay the consequences for. And that dialogue around how do we work together to do things that are more beneficial to the future of humanity was it was a real it wasn't the only story that, that about the end of the cold war but certainly the things like the montreal agreement in 1987 that did produce global action towards ozone reduction where the banning of cfcs the changes in the way that fringes are made and you know aerosol cans which used to make spray deodorants um that that, that made a big difference and that was partly drawn from these kind of consequences of what happens with ballistic missile systems with detonations that are potentially massive and keep on going and i think it, it all it all traces back to those first concerns in the 1950s of of households seeing nuclear detonations that you know in the immediate aftermath of the second world war people thought this destructive power was kind of awesome lots in the american military and politics thought that nuclear weapons could or nuclear devices could be used to build new deep water harbors that you could refashion the world in a really positive way maybe nuclear energy could be harnessed in ways that could um, save mankind. Mm. By the middle of the 1950s, people were starting to realise that watching public information films in the US where that showed doors being blown off the hinges or telling you to hide inside your fridge or hide under a table (laughs) as a nuclear blast detonated uh, was absolutely terrifying. And Mm. that all brought, I think, forward some of these things that we see today around, you know, flower power, around the idea that we should make peace, not war, that was, of course, connected to Vietnam as well but into the to the idea that there must be a way in which we must be able to get on with each other rather than putting our faith in technologies. And, you know, ironically, I guess, um, you know, the end of the Cold War has been catastrophic for global climate. So, I mean, it was great for uh, human rights around most parts of the world. I mean, we're, as we're recording, living through some of the sort of horrors that we hadn't calculated around what, what the Soviet Union would turn into, what Russia would turn into, and more. But the end of the Cold War was, you know, brought peace and prosperity, but it suddenly meant that we could burn vast amounts of fossil fuels because all of the oil and gas that was in the Soviet Union was no longer being sold to Cuba and Angola and communist countries, but available on the global markets and unlocked with Western technology, Western money. Uh, China, which sort of took its own trajectory at the end of the Cold War II to open up to, to partly to prevent following the same course as the Soviet Union, became a global factory that could produce everything we wanted cheaper with lower environmental con- con- constraints than happened. And, and that sudden surge of carbon burning um, has been catastrophic for us all. I mean, it's the redistribution has not been totally bad. You know, it's been good for the global south. It's been good for factories and workers and so on in many parts of the world with you know, obviously pluses and minuses. But taken as a whole, the last 30 years since about 1990 has seen a massive um, surge of industrialization and use of fossil fuels to the point that we're now baked into consequences that will happen over the next decades. Even if we stop, uh, all of us turn off our, our fossil fuel sources now and all somehow switch to clean energy, which we can't do. But let's say we could, we're still baked into a one and a half degree rise. And mm. we should be thinking about what that means for us rather than saying, we're doomed. It's, you know, what what kind of um, measures should we be planning ahead to try to anticipate some of those kinds of problems? So the book ends, I mean, a little bit gloomy, I think. Um, but I do, you know, there are technologies do make changes. Polit- politicians can make good decisions as well as bad ones. But, you know, there's nothing worse than pretending it's not happening. You know, if you're in a car and you can see the, the queue of traffic in front of you and you've got to put the brakes on, the sooner you do that, probably the better, you still need to brace for impact. Um, and, you know, some of those, there can be very thoughtful mitigations that minimise, possibly even reduce the worst of the consequences. Um, but there is, there are, there are, as we're all taught as children, there are consequences to actions. And those consequences mean when we buy lots of clothes and things are very cheap and we discard our flat screen TVs because we find a bigger one that's cost 300 quid 
I mean, you could just about afford that, then, you know, then there are obvious actions. And if, if governments haven't understood that, then they're partly to blame. But, you know, we elect them into power in our parts of the world. And we should probably be making a few more demands about what kind of what kind of trade offs we're willing to make, because so far we haven't had to engage with that at all. As you say, there's there's been this marked acceleration in the last sort of thirty or fifty years, which you, you know your your quotation there of um, Wallace Wells of this idea of more, more than half of all of the carbon fuel burnt in human history having been burnt since Seinfeld made its way onto TV screens was one of my favourite f- uh, facts to quote to my family to kind of because it just illustrates you know you kind of go that's insane what a ridiculous but true thing but you know what. That- what that means is if, if we, you know, we had it this summer or whatever we are, last summer in 22, where it hit over 40 degrees in the United Kingdom. And, yeah. you know, I suppose most people's reactions were, although we were all told to stay indoors, actually it didn't seem that bad. I mean, obviously it's very dangerous and sunscreen, you should probably stay indoors until things dip into the mid 30s. But, you know, in parts of the world like uh, Mecca, where it's going to, I mean, it's already over 50 degrees, you know, completing the Hajj, may not actually be physically possible without yeah. technological interventions. And what does that mean for things like Islam? In the Kumbh Mela, the big gathering that had uh, 50 million people in India last time it took place, you know, again, if the, if the conditions atmospherically and climatologically are, are dangerous, a risk to life, then how do devout Hindus express their devotion in ways that might need to be adapted? And you know, in some parts of Europe, in southern Europe, in, in Spain and Italy, there are you know, there are serious uh, projections of temperature rises into the mid fifties, and those kinds of things might make you concentrate about well, where you go on holiday, where you might buy a you know holiday home, but also to think well, if if they're wrong, then am I betting against the mainstream? And also, how do we how do we envisage the things that we take for granted? And the good thing about history is to remind that. Um, the world has always been changing. You know, there's always been dislocation. There's always been, unfortunately, famine and death and disease. There have often been, I mean, not often, but always been pandemics that rear their ugly heads. Mm. And, and trying to understand what those are and to, to think about how to be ready for them it probably requires some pretty strategic thinking right now. One of the, um, I suppose, one of the arguments that's put forward by people who like to sort of pretend that human um, action isn't responsible for some of the climate change that we're seeing right now is that we have always seen these peaks and troughs um, in climatic conditions. And when I started your book, I was like, oh, my God, no, has he written a book where he's going to be (laughs) providing all the historical evidence for these people to kind of go, oh, it's just always going to happen. We shouldn't worry about it. But the point you try to make is it has always happened. And what we can see is that if you're not prepared for those changes, empires fall and millions of people die. And even if that was all we were dealing with, that would be worrying enough. But the fact is that that marked acceleration that we've talked about shows that we are having an impact with our actions. And as you say, those changes are baked in so that even if we were to stop today, it wouldn't prevent those things from happening. And it's really hard sometimes to get people to understand that. But you're talking, you talked towards the end of the book about how we're actually seeing and living through some of the consequences of that. Obviously, with the crisis in Ukraine continuing, and you and I are both sitting in quite cold houses right now because of heating problems and all the rest of it. The idea of resources and the changes in the availability of those resources and actually the control of them. So the withholding of those resources is something that I'm sure people might be able to understand. So Russia, as you say, with its control over gas reserves for not just itself, but for much of Western Europe, has a big impact on us, the prices that we pay, or even the ability to to turn it on at all. And that is surely only going to get worse as these things become more of a crisis. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the Russia and Ukraine stuff that I'm sort of, uh, you know, obviously follow quite closely because of my uh, Silk Road's world, you know, is a slightly different story. I mean, I think we just listen to what you were saying there about, um, about being prepared. I mean, one of the interesting things as a historian is how how brittle empires, or how how apparently robust empires can suddenly collapse. Yeah, and a very good and obvious example that will be familiar, I'm sure, to most listeners is uh, is the Roman Empire, or more specifically, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And in in sort of popular imagination, uh, it's seen as the kind of the Huns rampaging and the Goths rampaging across Western Europe, murdering everyone they can find, and you know the poor Romans are busy having uh, dinner parties in their villas, 
sharing red wine that's come from Tuscany or goodness knows where and sitting by the wall and by, staring on Hadrian, sitting on Hadrian's wall, staring north or south and suddenly sort of packing up and there's, there's no one to answer their letters anymore. You know, in fact, what happens in, in that particular instance is there is a period of, of climatic shift that forces, a, that forces tribal peoples across the steppes to look for more pasture for their animals and because of water shortages and problems. And that produces a, you know, a, a, a chain reaction that shouldn't be difficult to manage. You know, it's a small, relatively small pinprick of how do you incorporate the movement of, you know, not enormous numbers of people. Hmm. And the interesting thing is, is that a relatively small amount of compression and uh, movement into Europe where there's confrontation, but not on a kind of absolutely epic scale, suddenly leaves the Roman Empire that, again, you'll remember from your history lessons, uh, everybody listening, uh, you know, essentially has run all of Western, what we think of Western Europe, uh, well, at least for 500 years. But mm. by about the year 400, the planks get pulled out so quickly that for the next 500 years, maybe even 600, maybe until about the year 1000, it's what historians used to call the Dark Ages, which is very unfashionable today, but essentially a time when trade collapses to being local, there's no long distance connections, there's very little in terms of culture and philosophy, there are bits of pockets here and there, uh, literacy levels plummet, people don't build from stone anymore, and you start to see the rise of a world that looks very, very different to Rome, which is a baronial class in their in their castles who are trying to monopolise the, the peasantry and you know, the royal structures that is very different to the metropolitan, urban, you know, bureaucratic world of Rome. Hmm. And the interesting thing is, how is it possible that uh, a few thousand people on horseback, I can understand that they can create a problem, but how come there's no recovery? And it's because robust political systems or what seem to be robust can suddenly collapse. And again, in the late 1980s, the Soviet Union looked like a global superpower. And yet, uh, for, you know, very small amount of pressure, particularly around oil pricing, uh, the Soviet Union came tumbling down and splintered yeah. and had the consequences that we see today. And so big things can suddenly fail. And in fact, big things usually do fail. So the curse of Akkad, you see a, a Mesopotamian empire at that time that is, you know, huge in its in its competence. But what, what people can't cope with or find difficult to cope with are sudden shocks. And the shock itself doesn't have to be a big one. It doesn't have to be climate related. Um, but everyone expects stability. And if you have challenges to that stability and you find problems that you don't recognise and you don't respond to quickly enough, then the House of Cards can tumble down extremely quickly. And one of the stories I think about global histories or big histories or thinking about different kinds of systems is that um, one pillar in a network fails and the whole thing fails. I suppose a bit like your laptop or your computer or your iPhone, if one button breaks, the whole device becomes unusable. You know, if mm. one function, one wire gives way, then the whole thing, you chuck it out. And I think that that's quite a useful way of thinking about, um, with network analysis, thinking about how, what it is the empires actually do. And empires and networks and structures try to deliver um, goods and resources into the center. And if there's a point of failure, then things can suddenly collapse and it's very hard to rebuild them and it's almost impossible to rebuild them quickly hmm. so i think thinking through some of those kinds of questions around what, what are those sparks and why is it that sometimes big shifts in temperature or climate or droughts or floods don't have any impact you know why not but sometimes when they do um, it's because there are underlying problems that it just aggravates and you know it's a bit like you know one bat in a market in wuhan can suddenly put the world indoors for two and two and a half years. You know, it turns out this week when we're talking, um, eighty percent of the population of China have had COVID and exposed to COVID in the last two weeks. You know, suddenly these magnifications of mm. what seem to be the flap of a butterfly's wings. And if you work with the sciences, you work with economists, you work with mathematicians, those kinds of things don't look as surprising as they perhaps might do to a historian. Which is why integrating the sciences and the humanities is so important. Um, Peter, I, I've pulled out a few of the moments that sort of struck me whilst I was reading the book. Um, but I wonder whether there were any moments when you were putting this book together that, that particularly excited you or that, that were surprising. Oh, my God. I mean, I love I love being a historian. I love being able to read things that I haven't read and um, and think, how did I not know that? 
you know, that's the best thing. And particularly if you're reading um, primary materials and sources and people writing at the time and, you know, reading texts in, uh, you know, cuneiform or written in Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago uh, in voices that, quite frankly, could be people sitting, well, maybe not sitting in a pub, but you probably got a slightly different level of <laughs> chat. Um, but, you know, they, the, the, the people writing thousands of years ago never ceases to amaze me, whichever period and whatever books I'm writing, about how vivid and how how similar people's reactions, feelings, emotions are to our own. And I think that the bit that's really exciting with the book is, is reading into different regions and periods um, and familiarising yourself and then finding things that you haven't thought about or found before. And, you know... Um, as as we both know with a with a good book it's 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 leaving the book in the middle of a paragraph and thinking how is it possible that i didn't know that and you know i'm a i'm a academic historian i'm supposed to know lots of things but <laughs> it's it's the sense of discovery across different regions different periods and you know some of the things i've worked on on regions i haven't thought about and worked on before like in oceania and the pacific of of understanding that the way in which islands were discovered and settled was not coincidental you know computer modeling can show that this was deliberate it was planned it was systematic rather than some guy gets blown out to sea uh gets lost and then you know comes back eventually and presumably lots that happened who didn't get back successfully but seeing that 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 way of, of thinking my gosh well if that was happening across thousands of miles how was that taking place you know what kind of technology t- technological changes were done to hulls of of canoes and then going to read and, you know, I promise you there are people who work on this who are geniuses and finding their research and thinking, God, this is just a whole new world. It's a bit like The Wizard of Oz, where it goes from black and white into colour. I'm sure some of the young <laughs> listeners won't know what The Wizard of Oz is. But it's <laughs> that world of, of, of just a kind of explosion and a riot of, of seeing the world in different ways and different perspectives. And, you know, that's a real, it's a real joy to be able to do that. And you know, it's not easy to put it all in a book. And if I'd had my own way, uh, it would have been sort of 6,000 pages rather than 600. But thinking through some of the things of, you know, the fact that our, our fossil fuel deposits globally are all related to past episodes of climate change. And mm. I guess my, my, my first sort of, you know, sit down and think about the meaning of life is that our, our species are great beneficiaries of past climate changes. You know, for almost all of the Earth's existence, and I mean 99.9% plus, uh, the atmospheric conditions wouldn't have supported human life. Hmm. And uh, a bit like the Garden of Eden, if you transgress, if you anger God or your gods, if you take for granted that conditions will be beneficial, and if you don't think about how your actions having consequences, well, I guess it's quite interesting that... Uh, Adam and Eve, and in the Judaic, the Christian, and the Islamic traditions, uh, you're punished ecologically. You're punished by environmental collapse. You're punished by being kicked out of a place that was perfect for you into a world where survival is difficult and you have to work. And that's probably quite a good metaphor for our age today of mm. our Garden of Eden, that if you don't tend it, if you are willfully stupid in how you behave, if you don't learn from the lessons of ignoring the today's forbidden fruit is probably fossil fuels. If you keep on going for it, then, you know, there comes a point of ejection. And I think it's fascinating to think that going back millennia, that's more or less exactly what our ancestors were thinking about and worrying about. That leaves us with a lot to think about, Peter, and probably a very good note to end on. As I said, reading this book, there were just so many things that surprised me and delighted me and uh, terrified me um you've done the hard work in uh, wrangling all that material together so you've made it very easy for the reader to to wander through all that time so thank you so much for the book thank you so much for the time to talk about it today it's much appreciated absolute pleasure and, and i hope to see you in in waterstones for events and um you know let's hope it's always terrifying launching a book <laughs> so i'm in the bit where i feel sort of uh, you know slightly anxious but uh it's been a joy to write and i and i hope that um that readers will enjoy it so, so give it a shot for a limited time signed copies of the earth transformed with a stunning exclusive sprayed edge design are available from waterstones.com <laughs>